Any guesses what we're looking at today? <laughs> we're in uh, South Central China uh, in what is called the Wulong Valley, locally known as the Valley of the Sleeping Dragon. And the dragon is right in front of you. <laughs> you see this mountain range here with these peaks? It's the ridge of a dragon. It's the Valley of the Sleeping Dragon. And this is Panda Country. It's sort of the heart of Panther Country. So today we're going to get intimate with not just giant pandas, but also red pandas. But before we start talking about pandas, there's bamboo. And we're looking at a bamboo forest that has been replanted as part of helping to save pandas, giant pandas, from going extinct. Now, you look at that tall bamboo and you think trees, and actually bamboo is a grass. Uh, there are some 1,200 species of uh, uh, bamboo. It grows anywhere from just a few inches like a lawn to over 150 feet. Uh, it is uh, quite versatile. Uh, you see uh, hardwood floors made out of it. You'll find clothing made out of it, uh, bed linens, towels, and so forth made out of it. It's a very, very strong material. It grows, depending on the species, in cold mountains uh, to the tropics. It's found naturally growing everywhere in the world except Europe and Antarctica. Mm -hmm. Now, the species, uh, the life expectancy varies from as short as just one year to 120 years. And one thing that bamboo has in common is that an entire species when it's getting to the end of its life uh, time, it will flower and then set seeds and then the entire species dies. Mm -hmm. And then a new species from the set seeds uh, regrows. Mm -hmm. So for that reason, you're gonna find that giant pandas need to live where there's at least two types of bamboo that they like to eat because you're gonna find out that they're very picky eaters. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, because if they're just in one area, uh, if you're just in an area with one species and they die, then the panda itself is in trouble for food. Anybody want to guess what the word panda means? How about bamboo eater? <laughs> now, when I, when I ask the kids, you know, what word, what country does the word panda come from, they always yell out China. And it's not a Chinese word, it's actually a Nepalese word. Uh, around 1820, in the forest of Nepal, a, a British scientist studying animals sees these little red animals high in the trees eating lots of bamboo. He's speaking Nepalese, and he says the Nepalese words Nagalia punya, which means eating bamboo. Well, the word punya got anglicized into panda, and that stuck as their name. Okay? It wasn't actually until almost 50 years later in the forest of China that a French missionary sees these strange looking black and white animals also eating bamboo and he says must be more pandas. So now we have two completely unrelated species of animals that have the same name just because they eat the same thing. <laughs> so, so the giant panda, uh, the, the, their origins are traced back about 10 million years, but they're really long distant relatives to uh, raccoons, weasels, badgers, and skunks. It's an animal. Yes, Ken? Are pandas bears? Giant pandas are. Okay. Okay, and I'm about to tell you about the red panda. <laughs> so the red panda has been misidentified for a long, long time. They've been called a fire fox, a fox bear, a red bear cat, and when the giant panda came along, the lesser panda. Um, they are not related to foxes, bears, or cats. They are actually, with the advances in genet genetics, uh, are in their own family of animals. Um, I always mispronounce this one, but uh, Elridae. And, that, and so they're not, they're not bears. Red pandas are not bears. 
There's actually two species of them. You have the Chinese red panda, and you'll notice basically a reddish face with some white facial markings. And then the western red panda, or also known as the Himalayan red panda, and they have that white face with some red markings on it. At the St. Louis Zoo, we have the western red panda. We happen to have two of them, uh, Pete and uh, uh, Winnie. Uh, Pete's about 13 years old, and Winnie is roughly 10 years old. So their current range, okay, we're looking into South Central Asia there. Uh, their current range uh, is uh, Southern China, Tibet, and Northern Myanmar for the Chinese red panda. And then uh, Northern India, Nepal, and Bhutan for the Western red panda. And basically there's a river in this uh, region that uh, divides the two species of pandas and they don't cross the river. Um, historically, also, uh, scientists have found the, the relics, uh, uh, bones of the red panda in North America. They have found them in this Tennessee and Washington states. So obviously, over time, they had a much bigger range than they have in modern time. They prefer uh, cool, temperate forests. Uh, with fallen logs and tree stumps that they could use as camouflage when they are down on the ground a little bit that they are. They definitely need a fresh water source. And they like higher elevations, between five and 15,000 feet. They like it cool, as I, as I said. They are carnivores, okay? They are carnivores, but they have a highly specialized bamboo diet, and they've adapted to that, and you're gonna see um, what I'll call environmental adaptation between these and the giant pandas as we proceed. So while they are carnivores, 95% of their diet are bamboo leaves, the leaves. And I emphasize the leaves, as you can see uh, in a picture here, eating the leaves, because the giant panda likes to eat the stalk. <laughs> so it has very low protein and fat content versus meat, but it's very high fiber. When they do need a little bit of protein, uh, they'll be trying to get, uh, particularly a, a pregnant female, uh, they're gonna be trying to get things like eggs or small rodents, uh, insects and such. Uh, but they will also eat some fruits and roots and maybe lichen, which is a type of uh, moss that grows in trees. On a daily basis, they eat 20 to 30% of their body weight. So they spend a lot of time uh, chomping. 10 to 12 hours a day. It's a tough, tough item to, to digest, and they only actually digest about a third of what they eat. Hmm. It's said, and it's hard to believe, but it's said that in the course of a day, a red panda could consume about 200,000 leaves. Now, they're about the size of a big house cat. They're gonna be between 10 and 20 pounds, about a two foot body length. But while they're carnivores, unlike other carnivores, their teeth are large and flat. And that's for the grinding surface that they need to grind down the, uh, the bamboo, which contains silica. So they have very large and large chewing muscles. And I'm gonna show you a, a picture of their skull uh, a little bit uh, later, but they have flaring jaw bones and a sagittal crest across the, 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 the um, uh, the skull, where all the muscles connect from the jaw all the way up to the, the top of the skull because they're chewing, constantly chewing, so extremely st uh, strong muscles. Now another adaptation, and I'll show you a skeletal example of in a bit, is that when you look at their paw, they have basically five fingers, five digits, and a pseudo thumb. So it would be, and I'm gonna put the mic down for a second, A natural, it would look something like this, okay? And what they're doing, what they're doing, that pseudo thumb doesn't work like our thumb, okay? It's not opposable. What they're doing is oftentimes where they've got some tough bamboo, they'll wedge that piece of bamboo in, in where that pseudo thumb is against their hand, close down with their paw so they can tear it apart with their teeth. Uh, their claws are only semi-retractable, which makes sense. They spend the majority of their time up in trees. 
a large bushy tail as you can see for balance. Now you notice the eye tracks uh, on their face and their forehead patterns are unique and they actually recognize each other by the patterns that you see there. They can be active anytime, but it's primarily that they're active at dawn and dusk. As I indicated, spend a lot of time in trees, it's some 90%. When they're not eating, they're resting because it takes a lot of work for everything that they're eating. They're not territorial, so they're not going to defend the territory like some animals do, but they do have a home range, which depends on the amount of food. Uh, the size of it depends on the amount of food that they have. So it'll range from a half a square mile to as much as six square miles. Migration is vertical. Okay, so in the wintertime, they're going to be in the lower elevations. Okay, and in the summertime, to get out of the heat with that beautiful fur coat that they, they wear year-round, they're going to go to the higher elevations to cool off, get up about three, about three miles. The sense of smell, very important to them. Um, they use urine a lot to communicate with, um, uh, and their paws also will uh, emit uh, their sense. This animal uses a common latrine, so it's actually one of the easiest animals for a keeper to clean up in a zoo. Um, they'll all go in the exact same spot. You know, most animals are just going to do it anywhere. But in the wild, the purpose of the common latrine is since you're a solitary animal, okay, you go to the latrine and move on. So if there's a female that's an asterisk, her scent's going to change. So when she goes to the latrine, the male picks up on the scent that she's an asterisk, and now he's going to track her to find her to see about mating. Um, the only time you're going to see them together is breeding and, again, the female with young. Very little aggression out of these animals. Uh, when they do get into disputes with each other, it's a batting of their four, four paws, really. Courtship, they chirp like birds. They actually sound like birds when they're chirping. It lasts about a, a day, 24 hours. It's usually breeding, uh, breeding in the January to March time frame. So gestation, about four and a half months. Here's a picture of a couple of uh, two-week uh, old uh, uh, cubs. Usually they have two, but they can have as many as four. They weigh four to five ounces. Remember that, because I'm going to come back to that weight later on. Four to five ounces, so they're really, really small. It's about the size of a stick of butter. You know, think about it in those terms, okay? The female's going to raise the young. Now, they're not going to start chewing and eating bamboo until they're about two months of age. And bamboo's tough. So mom pre-chews it before uh, the baby, the cubs, start to try to digest it and eat it. They matured about a year and a half when they leave their mother at that point. So in the wild, they live between 10 and 12 years. So Pete and Winnie, you know, in the wild would be at the end of their life expectancy. But in managed care, they can go into the late teens and maybe 20. They have a number of uh, natural predators in the wild, um, and their color is fantastic camouflage. Now, if you remember, I've mentioned in the past that many predatory animals, they don't see colors very well. They don't have the full color spectrum. So if you've got a red panda that's high up in a tree like you're seeing there, they have that rather dark brown to black underside. So from looking up from the ground, it's going to uh, camouflage right into the shadows of the forest canopy. And uh, with a little bit of red, that camouflages into the red lichen, the red moss that grows in the trees. So they've got excellent camouflage and therefore spend most of their time uh, up in the trees. So their main predators are going to be leopards and doles, which are a wild dog. I've shown you a picture of what they look like. Um, Asian cats, golden eagles, uh, along the bottom pictures here, and the yellow-throated marten basically go after the, the young. But the adults uh, usually have to deal with leopards and doles. They are classified as endangered. Uh, population is decreasing. While they've got a number of natural predators, their main issue is human beings. 
Uh, population is estimated between 2,500 and 10,000 left in the world. Uh, the big issue is habitat loss from development and agriculture. Also, in some cases, um, cutting down forests illegally. Um, they do, if they come close to domestic animals, can pick up diseases for domestic animals. But they do suffer a lot from poaching. They're poached for their fur. Uh, the fur is really, really soft, and they turn them into uh, capes and hats. Uh, bridegrooms, uh, uh, indigenous people, want to, bridegrooms want to make hats out of their fur, uh, and it's a good luck charm uh, for, your, for your marriage. Uh, and the other issue is global warming. Global warming is a problem uh, for bamboo uh, because it's going to cause bamboo species uh, to go extinct, which lessens the food availability for these animals because they don't eat all 1,200 different types. But again, there's hope with all of our help. There's five countries that the, uh, five of the six countries that they're in currently have set up sanctuaries. There's some 60 sanctuaries for them. A program called Forest Guardians uh, was established a number of years ago. It started out with 16 people that were concerned uh, with protecting them and not letting them go extinct in the wild. That has grown to a force of over 150. And basically, these are forest rangers. Um, the Red Panda Network.org uh, are experts in red pandas, and they do a lot of fundraising uh, to help support these sanctuaries and also. Uh, these people who volunteer so much of their time to protect the animals. Uh, accredited zoos like the St. Louis Zoo are also part of these programs and helping to support uh, saving these animals. So again, please support our zoo. A fun fact, the uh, Tibetan tribal people believe a red panda is the reincarnation of a Buddhist monk. So we're looking at a giant panda research facility near the Wulong Valley. But before we delve into pandas, let's give some perspective. Uh, in the family of bears, uh, there are eight species, and all bears are omnivores. Okay, so they're like us, they'll eat anything. So looking at the eight bear species, as we start on the left upper, we've got the American black bear, in the center, the Asian black bear, then the giant panda. He's an omnivore, but he's the most herbivorous of all omnivores. So he's gonna eat a lot of vegetation where he lives. In the middle row, we have the brown uh, bear, also grizzly bear, which is sort of a subspecies of brown bear. We have polar bears, which are the largest species of bear, and they're the most carnivorous of all bears, because not a lot grows where they normally live. Uh, then we have the sloth bear on the far right there, and they're from the Indian subcontinent. And they're the most insectivorous of all bears, because again, not a lot of other animals to eat, not a lot of vegetation to eat where they're, where they're thriving. And then on the bottom, we have the uh, spectacled bear from South America. Um, and uh, they, they get that name because this white that you see around on her face, so for some of them it goes all the way around like a pair of glasses on them, so they're called the spectacled bear. And then we have the sun bear, which is uh, the smallest bear species. They only get to about uh, maybe 150 pounds or so, a, a male. Uh, but don't let their small size uh, fool you. Um, they have extremely thick skin, and um, they've been known when tigers have gone after them to have killed a tiger that, that is more than double their weight. Um, so they can actually turn their body within their skin uh, when a tiger grabs them and uh, attack that tiger. So the bears we have at the St. Louis Zoo are going to be the brown bear, the grizzly bear, the, uh, the uh, polar bear, and then the, um, the, the sun bear, the smallest bear species. <coughs> So giant pandas, um, scientists traced their origins back about 19 million years, which would make them the oldest species of bear. Their home range uh, is that red ring you've seen that I've uh, uh, penciled in on the map of China there, and it stretches from southern and eastern China, uh, uh, 
with, with Beijing at the top there, down to northern Myanmar and Vietnam. However, their current range is just that small green area that you see. And that is rather fragmented uh, a range of uh, covering some six mountainous areas. They too like uh, cool forests, damp, misty, tempered forests is their favorite, particularly old growth forests. Uh, good for regenerating bamboo and good for birth shelters because a female is going to make her den in the hollow of uh, old, big old trees. They like an elevation of about four to 12,000 feet. And again, in the winter, they're going to be at that lower elevation. Uh, and then in the summer, to get out of the heat, they're going to move further, uh, further up. They do like snow in the winter time. Uh, and as I mentioned before, the area has to have at least two species of bamboo that they like to eat. And, and while pandas eat um, a variety of bamboos, individual animals like individual types. So, I mean, you could say, yeah, they all like about 35 different kinds, but some of them won't eat all 35 different kinds that pandas eat. You know, they have their favorites, just like we have our favorites. Physically, uh, they're going to weigh about 150 to 250 pounds. Um, stand a little over five feet to a little over six. Uh, the males tend to be almost 20% bigger than females. They have a rather large head. And what they get this large head from you know, are these, these really flaring cheekbones that you see here. And uh, here's that pronounced sagittal crest that you have. So all those muscles for chewing are coming up and attached to here. And when you see a panda uh, chewing bamboo, uh, what actually occurs, if you look closely, they'll, as they chew, their ears almost touch. They, you actually see the ears moving as they're chewing. And you, you just have to go see it, you know, to see this. But that, that is exactly what's going on. Now, here's a profile to show you the pronounced sagittal crest there. When I was at the zoo in San Diego and I would talk about these animals, I'd have the skull of a giant panda and I'd have the skull of a red panda and I would show the kids this and I'd have one in each hand and I'd show them the big one first and I said, who is this? And they said, oh, it's a giant panda. And I'd show them this one and they said, oh, that's a baby panda. No, it's a red panda, okay? It's a red panda. And, um, you know, this is, is part of environmental adaptation. You know, the body adjusts to survival. Uh, and so the, the, the two skulls look almost identical, but they're two different species of animals. For the giant panda, you can see that barrel shape that they have. They always are going to sit upright just like you have. It's not a posed picture. That's how they like to eat. And um, they've got uh, short but massive fork, four quarters or four legs. That's because they'll climb up in the trees at times. Um, their paws, here's a skeleton that I wanted to show you, the paw. You've got your five digits and that pseudo thumb. Same thing as the, as the red panda. So I don't have a picture of a red panda's uh, skeletal. Uh, I couldn't find it, but anyhow, a, a um, giant panda, red panda, they're going to look identical. Again, more environmental adaptation of two different species. So you can see in this, in this drawing here what that false or pseudo thumb looks like and compare it to the human hand here, and that's our real thumb. And then look at this panda's hand, the giant panda's hand, against a brown bear hand. And again, you don't have that pseudo thumb. So it's a really unique adaptation for this animal. So one of my favorite mythologies has to do with how they got their color. Uh, according to uh, uh, tribal people, pandas used to be all white. And um, one day, a leopard was attacking a, uh, a panda cub. And the leopardess, uh, excuse me, the leopardess, there was a shepherdess uh, who saw the leopard attacking the panda cub. 
So she intervened to save the cub. And in the process of doing so, the leopard killed the shepherdess. So all the pandas cried over her death. And in Tibetan mythology, uh, for uh, um, the morning ceremony, what you'll do is you'll cover your arms in black ash. Mm -hmm. And um, so they covered their arms in the, in the black ashes. And they cried so much uh, to uh, wipe away their tears with their paws, their black paws, they wiped their eyes. And that's how they got their black. And there was so much wailing and sorrow for the loss of the shepherdess. Then they put their paws over their ears to <laughs> blot out the sound. And that's how they got their black ears. And then they consoled each other and wrapped their black arms around each other. And that's how they get the black across their back. So that's Tibetan mythology on how a giant panda gets its coloration. So as you can see here, their color pattern really blends in very well to snowy landscape. Uh, their hair is uh, uh, quite short, uh, thick, it's very woolly. Uh, it's a little on the coarse side. Um, I don't have any more, but I, when I used to do this, I would have a little sample of uh, uh, panda hair, and uh, people were surprised how coarse it was. It wasn't as soft as the ones you buy in the gift store. Uh, it is slightly oily, and basically that works as, as uh, uh, water preventative, uh, preventing water penetration to their skin. Their eyesight is rather poor. Their pupils look like a cat's uh, pupil, with sort of a vertical uh, pupil. Excellent hearing, though. Um, they can hear an ultrasonic range, so sounds that we can't hear. An excellent sense of smell, and that's important, and we'll find out that in a second. Uh, like other bears, uh, or unlike other bears, I should say, their teeth uh, are broader and flatter, and that's from chewing all that bamboo. Okay, so pandas actually have the worst bite of any bear, even though polar bears and grizzly bears are much bigger, these guys have the worst bite because they're chewing 12 to 14 hours a day to get the nutrients that they need from that bamboo. So they eat about 25 different types. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, each has its own favorite. So they're a little bit more focused on bamboo. 99% of their diet is bamboo. Um, 26 and 33 pounds, so not as much compared to the red panda as far as the percentage of your, of your body weight. They're gonna strip that, as you can see, Breaking into it, eventually they're going to strip the outer uh, portion and then uh, eat the inside. The, the high fiber is very difficult for uh, them to digest and access, access the nutrients um, and get much calories out of it. So that's why they're eating so much. They will, again, you're going to have this basically, basically from a pregnant female, are going to go after maybe some eggs. Uh, the dead remains of an animal, because they really don't go out and kill other animals, and maybe some other plants. They can be active day or night, uh, but primarily first thing in the morning, and then again late in the day. Now, unlike other bears, they do not hibernate. And they don't hibernate because what the foods that they eat don't produce body fat for them because when your bear's hibernating, it's living off the body fat that it's accumulated. I'll be talking about polar bears in a later session next year. Um, and uh, they live uh, off, off their body fat, uh, a female when she's pregnant. Um, so they've got food year round where they live. The bamboo's going to grow in all of these temperatures. Uh, and uh, uh, no, absolutely no need for hibernation. They're not territorial, uh, but they do have a range. So they're not going to defend an area. Other bears are going to cross the area. Uh, but basically, depending on the amount of bamboo, small range of three to seven square miles. Females' range tends to be smaller, and usually females don't overlap each other. I mentioned this before, winter lower elevations, summer higher elevations to get out of the heat. They do scent mark the area, and that's basically to avoid each other, except at breeding time. Extremely agile. Um, 
They walk sort of with a roly-poly rolling gait, about a mile and a half an hour as far as speed. They can gallop, but they really don't do that that much. Um, an adult panda really doesn't have any predators. Uh, they climb trees as youngsters to avoid uh, danger. When I would talk about pandas and there would be a, a, a pathway leading to the panda exhibit, and I might be in that pathway talking to people about the animals, and they would say, how long is the wait in the line and to see the pandas? And I would say, look up. And in the top of the trees, you would see a panda cub. And everybody would go, they would gasp. And they said, he's going to fall. No, they don't fall. This comes naturally to them. That's where they go to escape that leopard that we talked about, or those uh, 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 dolls that might be in the area. So they, they are extremely, extremely good at being up in those trees. Um, only the young play, and they like to tumble and roll and body twist and slide in the snow, just like human kids. Um, as far as communication, it's a couple of different methods. Visually, they'll show aggression with their head bopping up and down, uh, maybe paw swatting and biting as far as aggression is concerned. Uh, Non-aggression, uh, they'll kind of turn their head, maybe cover their eyes or cover their nose with their paws. Um, yeah, it's basically signals uh, to each other. They do make sounds, but they're generally quiet. Um, the most sound you hear is when the female wants to breed, and again, she chirps like a bird when she's fertile to breed, and the male bleats when his testosterone level is high. They mainly rely on the sense of smell, though. And here's an example. What you're looking at is a giant male panda doing a handstand. This is his head down here. His rump is up there. What's he doing? He's trying to impress the ladies. The ladies are impressed by big males. So what he wants to do, his scent gland is under his tail. He wants to rub his butt as high up on the tree as he possibly can to impress the ladies that he's a big panda and she should be on the lookout for him to breed with and not breed with anybody else. And that's exactly what he's doing, okay? And the scent uh, conveys uh, sex, it conveys age, reproduction status, his testosterone level is high, and who he is. Um, mating season is usually late February to early April, and the males will compete to breed. And when it comes to male pandas, their physical bulk size matters when they're competing, because it's usually the bigger of the two pairs that's gonna win out in, in, uh, in a battle to breed. The interaction is uh, between the male and female is very brief. Um, the uh, female is only receptive in a range of two to seven days. Usually it's about a three day period. Uh, and uh, if he doesn't get her in that, that small window of time, she's not interested, she's not gonna breed. Try your luck again next year. <laughs> and uh, you know, compilation takes about five minutes and after that she wants him out of there. And she will beat him up if he doesn't. So, and, and he's happy to do that, you know, he leaves, he goes on, and he's gonna look for another female to breed with, okay? Because once he's bred, it's all on her after that as far as taking care. Um, gestation varies from roughly three months to roughly six months, with an average of about four and a half. Could you imagine, you don't know if you're gonna be pregnant for nine months or 18 months? So, and what that is all about is what they call delayed implantation. The female, her body can sense when it's going to be a good time for her cubs to be born. So while they breed and the cellular mass forms, it doesn't implant until her body says, okay, in roughly four and a half months or three months or so, uh, it's gonna be a good time for your, for your baby to be born. At the San Diego Zoo, uh, we had six births there, and um, uh, five of them were, were natural. Uh, she gave birth all, for all six of her cubs within a narrow two-week time span. Okay, it was like clockwork. She would only give, give birth at that same time. Her body sensed that was the best time for her cubs to be born. She could be pregnant, 
but and the keepers know because when they put the two together they know when they breed but they don't know if she's really pregnant or not because they can't detect uh, a heartbeat until they're within 15 days of birth because they're so extremely small as you can see a picture of newborns their size four ounces the same as that red panda that i just talked to you about their size was four ounces you know that animal the female was probably about 10 to 15 pounds maybe not quite 15 pounds uh, and this animal mom she's a couple hundred pounds and she gives same size uh, uh, baby. Um, their weight is about one tenth of one percent of the mother's weight. It's basically the most helpless uh, placental baby of any animal. Um, they can have twins, but in the wild, one of the twins never survives because mom can only take care of one at a time. Um, and you can see when she moves them around, she's going to carry them in her mouth. Uh, and she does need to move them periodically as they're growing up to keep them away from possible predators. They need to nurse quite a few times during the course of the day, anywhere from 6 to 14 times. And nursing can take up to 30 minutes. Um, they're blind until they're 75 days old and uh, they will den for three and a half months and she'll move them from site to site. So that's why she wants an old forest with old trees and she's already staked out where her dens are going to be that she'll move her babies around so that uh, she lessens the chance for predators finding them. As far as development is concerned, they get their adult coloration, as you can see right here, a youngster next to mom at about a month. Uh, they're walking well at about six months. They start sampling mom, uh, bamboo, imitating mom at about five to six. They're weaned by the time they're nine months. And then they're going to leave mom at 18 months of age. They're not sexually mature until they're roughly six years. Now, their life is teeth related. Okay, in the wild, it's basically going to be about 20 years. And in managed care, it can be 30 plus years. And why I say teeth related, that bamboo is very tough. They wear their teeth out. And they get to a point where they're gone and they can't crunch into that bamboo anymore. So they can't bring in nutrition. So in the wild, basically, when the teeth are gone, they're gone. But in managed care, one of the things that San Diego developed was bamboo bread. So volunteers every day would take bamboo and grind it up into bamboo flour. And then the, um, the keepers would turn that and bake that into bamboo bread uh, so that the older bears would have food to eat. So only the young and uh, juveniles have uh, predators. By the time they're two and a half years old, they're about 110 pounds, so they can pretty much take care of themselves. They've got a strong bite at that point in time. Um, and as you can see here, I talked about them being high up in trees. And you would see sites like that in San Diego, except no snow. Um, predators, you saw pictures before, yellow-throated mar uh, martins, weasels, golden cats, and doles. They basically suffer from uh, human threats, habitat loss, and fragmentation. As you can see here, a scene in China where the landscape has been devastated. Because of fragmentation, you get uh, loss of good genetics, um, and um, you also have a problem with climate change. It's expected over the next 80 years, 35% of bamboo species will be gone. Poaching as a problem has largely been eliminated because basically the Chinese eliminate the poachers, so that solves that problem. Um, on the International Union of Conservation for Nature, they're listed as vulnerable. And they were downlisted from endangered in 2017 because their population has started increasing around 2015 in the wild. Roughly uh, 2,000 at the time, about 1,000 of them were mature bears, the others were slow adults. And then there were about 400 in breeding centers and zoos around the world.
protections really started around um, 1957. The Chinese started doing protection efforts for them. First reserves established in 63. Now there's some 60 reserves, and the Chinese staffed them with rangers to protect them from poachers. The picture you're seeing here, three cubs, this is at one of the, the Panda Research facilities. Um, the red, the uh, very intense efforts for protecting them. There's a lot of international, uh, as well as the national laws and anti-skin trade uh, for their, their fur. Uh, policies are put in place in China uh, to uh, eliminate illegal logging, to convert croplands uh, into uh, uh, bamboo forests, as you can see here, the pictures that were being done, and to connect the habitats, the fragmented habitats, so that they can roam naturally and have better genetics. Um, so a strong you know, conservation effort has been focused here, and there's a lot of international partnerships with a lot of the accredited zoos working with the Chinese, uh, not only supporting these efforts, but actually doing field research work. And that's part of the pact that zoos make when they get a, um, uh, a giant panda from China, not just paying the rental fee, but the fact that you're going to engage in some research work, and it usually means on the ground in China, uh, helping to save the animals. A lot of important developments have, uh, have occurred for breeding programs. Uh, San Diego was the only zoo in the world outside of China that actually had um, natural births. All the others were artificial insemination. And what they found was that you had to expose the male and the female to each other's odors before you actually brought them together. Um, you know, and that was part of what was going on in the wild. Remember, they put up their, uh, they sent mark different areas and they're basically putting up advertisements so they get used to, uh, to each other just with their scents. Um, and they learned other cues in their behaviors and that bleeding uh, and, uh, that the male would do and the chirping the female would do. And they basically found that they have more success and, uh, when the, the bears are used to each other and they're able to mate with somebody they prefer to mate with. Twins born in the wild are no longer lost. The zoo developed baby panda formula, okay? And an artificial, you know, Playtex nursery, well, developed one for uh, panda babies and established a protocol um, that when she has cubs about twice a day, they swap out the cubs with mom so that she bonds with both. So half the time they're nursing with her mother, half the time they're taking the baby panda formula. So a lot of success. And here's a picture of a one month old being held at the San Diego Zoo. Some fun facts, panda poop. It comes out green. It looks like avocados. Okay. <laughs> Ninety-nine percent of their diet is eating green bamboo. And that's it. Comes out the same way. Annual rent for a giant panda is about one point one million dollars in the U.S. San Diego used to get a fifty percent discount because of all the inroads and development efforts uh, and the results that they got. So. That's it. Thank you for listening. Uh, Bell Pandas. Yeah. Uh, questions? Does yes, St. Louis Zoo have a plan for giant pandas? Not that I've heard of. Yeah, it's, it's a big financial undertaking to do uh, because the Chinese are going to approve the type of uh, habitat that you have uh, for them. And like I said, it's not just paying the fees. Uh, it's then also, um, uh, you know, the research work that you have to do. And St. Louis is involved in a lot of things now. They've got a lot, a lot, several development projects underway. One is to redevelop the children's zoo, uh, besides the, um, the wild care uh, park. And they do a number of conservation projects around the world, quite a few, more than people really know about. Um, and, um, but so I haven't heard of anything here. How many uh, zoos around the world have giant pandas? I don't know that. Uh, and I know the, the numbers changed. Um, currently in North America, you've got 
San Diego and Washington, D.C. Uh, you used to have them also at Atlanta, Memphis. Um, there's Canada has a pair that are shared half the year in Toronto, half the year in Calgary. And um, the Chapultepec Zoo in Mexico City uh, has pandas. Uh, and they have an odd situation, and I don't know the history of it, but to my knowledge, they're the only zoo that actually owns their pandas. Everybody else rents them. Hmm. Yeah. Is the temperature a controlling element around the world? Uh, they, they, they want a cooler environment. I mean, you, you really don't, they don't like real hot weather. But Mexico has one. Yes. But, you know, Mexico City is fairly high. Other questions? What continents do pandas exist in Hawaii? Only China. That's it. That, that, um, that, that, um, let's go back. That's just it. That, that red area was the historic area. That's the only place they're found. And in modern times, just where you see the green on the map there in the mountains of South Central China. Did you yes, say there was evidence in North America? I was, that was red pandas. Okay. Red pandas, not giant pandas. But they needed bamboo also. Correct. North America. Yes, we have North uh, bamboo that grab, grows here naturally. Yeah, just Europe and Antarctica, that it doesn't grow naturally. And did you say the red ones are carnivores? Yes. Just like the giant pandas, they're carnivores. And it's just a unique adaptation to survive in the environment that you're in. You know, for millions of years, you learn how to do it. Well, our next, uh, our next talk isn't until next year. Um, and uh, I don't have a date yet. Jennifer's going to be giving me some uh, dates after busy season settles down for you. Uh, what I'm going to talk about are a couple of animals that live near pandas. Uh, continue this. We're going to talk about talkins, which we have at the St. Louis Zoo. And we're going to talk about one of the rarest snakes in the world that lives there, the Mang Mountain Pit Viper. We have those at the San Diego, uh, St. Louis Zoo. And uh, another animal that lives in Asia, but not with the pandas, are siamangs. They're, if you remember my first talk on apes, I talked about great apes and lesser apes. And this is one of the lesser apes, the, um, uh, the siamang. So I don't know if I have anybody in the audience who doesn't like snakes. So when I do this presentation, what I do is the, the Siamangs and the Talkins first, and then I'll flash up a minute or mission screen. So if you don't want to see the talk on snakes, you can leave the room. And, uh, but actually, they are an extremely interesting snake, and uh, there aren't many left alive in the wild. So any other questions? One last chance. Well, thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn.